Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These questions and comments typically come from the comments that I get on the videos on YouTube and on Library, as well as on Mastodon, on Reddit, and sometimes through email. And the first question that I want to address is, hey DT, how did you colorize your LS permission outputs? So what this person is asking is, in my videos, I'm often using a terminal, and one of the most common terminal commands you run is LS. But when I run LS, my LS looks different than your LS, right? It's got a lot more information and it's very colorful, and the permissions for each file are also listed in my LS output, and it's in the standard RWX format, the read, write, execute format, and each column for RWX is a different color, and it looks really cool. It's very attractive, and he's asking why his LS doesn't look like that. Well, the reason is because my LS isn't actually LS. My LS is a program called EXA. It is a Rust program that kind of mimics some of what LS can do, but it gives you a little bit more coloration, a little more bling to the ls command. Now if you want to see me talk about exa a little bit on camera, a while back I did a video called From Noob to Power User with Linux Mint Cinnamon. And somewhere in that video I spent a few minutes talking about the exa command. If you just want to go grab the exact exa command that I run as far as my alias for ls, go to my GitLab page and look for my .files repository. In my .files repository, find my bash rc and look for the ls alias somewhere in my bash rc. And the next question is, hey DT, why are you bald? I'm not even going to acknowledge that question. I, I, maybe I should just add bald to my filter list, my ban filter list for YouTube. So anytime somebody posts a comment with the word bald, they just immediately get blocked. The next comment is, hey, 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 wait, how did you record the TTY? So any video you guys have seen me where I drop to a TTY prompt and you're wondering how I do that and still record, because obviously when you drop to TTY, you're no longer in a X display environment, right? That's not really in an X server. And you're wondering how in the heck could I record that thing? Well, there are two possibilities. And typically for me, when you see me recording myself doing something in a TTY, I'm doing it in a virtual machine. So I'm actually in a virtual machine. I drop to the TTY prompt inside the virtual machine, but my host machine is still recording all of it. And that's typically the easiest way if you want to record, you know, like a TTY prompt or you know, a command line installation. Like if I was going to install something like Arch or Gentoo, the easiest way to do that is typically I just install them in a virtual machine and I record the virtual machine installation. Now you could do it on physical hardware, but what you would need is two different machines. You would need one to actually do the installation on, and then you would need to have a second machine to record it, to stream to. And you would need some kind of capture device, such as the Elgato Cam Link or one of the Magewell capture cards, and you would have to capture the display on the machine that you're actually running the installation to and, and send it to the other computer where you could record it through something like OBS. And the next question is, hey DT, I installed this distro in Vert Manager, but when I run an X render, it does not show me any resolution that I can use. I type in my resolution, but I get a feedback size not found in available modes. So what he's talking about here is he installed this distribution inside Vert Manager, and it's not the right screen resolution. It's some small resolution, usually 800 by 600, and he probably wants to blow that up to something like 1920 by 1080. But when he puts in the command xrender space dash s for set a resolution space and then 1920 by 1080 for the resolution, it comes back, hey, that resolution is not available. Well, what you have to do is you just have to run xrender without any arguments. It's going to tell you all the available resolutions. If the one you want is not there, then there are ways to force it to do a resolution, but the easiest way is to change the video driver so it supports the resolutions you want. So in Vert Manager, there's like five or six different video drivers to pick from. Uh, some of the ones off the top of my head that I know are there are QXL, because that's the default one I think that it defaults to. There's VGA and there's Vert IO. So if the default QXL video driver does not list your resolution, what I would suggest is switch to Vert IO. I've found that to be a better video driver and then run the XRender command and see if the resolution you want is now available. 
And the next question also involves virtualization. I had a lot of virtual machine questions this time around. Hey, DT, how do you make your virtual box respect your dark theme? So when you launch VirtualBox, it doesn't respect your GTK themes or anything like that because VirtualBox is a Qt program. It's a Qt application. So you need a program to set your Qt themes. And you need a program installed called Qt5ct. Install that program. It's a graphical application. When you launch it, you can then set your Qt theme and it should affect all of your Qt programs, including VirtualBox. And the next question is, hey DT, I see you're not running EXWM today. How's it going? I would like to see an update on how things are going with you and EXWM. So he's talking about, I, I told you guys I would probably live in EXWM for a couple of weeks just to see how it goes. But he saw me in a video not using EXWM. And I know the video he's probably talking about. It's the uh, top 12 Linux apps <laughs> that I did the other day. So I did a video called the top 12 Linux apps. And I know a lot of people are going to watch that video that are not really Linux users. They're probably Windows and Mac users thinking about switching to Linux and they want to see what kind of applications are available on Linux. And I did not want to do that video and record it inside EXWM, which is basically full screen Emacs is your window manager. And then all these applications I'm launching are going to be full screen inside an Emacs buffer. You know, all of these new Linux people are have, going to have no idea what Emacs is or what's going on on that video. So I did not want to do that video inside Emacs. So what I did is I logged into OpenBox to do that video because it's just a normal floating window manager. I thought, you know, I wouldn't get really, you know, a lot of questions about what desktop environment or window manager I'm in because I was wanting to avoid those kinds of questions. So that's why often, you know, I will pick and choose exactly what window manager I log into based on the audience I'm speaking to. Obviously, if I was doing something more advanced for more experienced Linux users, and I would have just stuck with EXWM for that video, but I have been living in EXWM and it's going just fine. I mean, it's basically Emacs. If you know how Emacs works, then Emacs as a window manager is actually pretty comfortable. It's not difficult. I've been able to record videos using EXWM and I've been able to have all my auto start programs. I, 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 everything works. Like As soon as I log into EXWM, I auto start my system tray, my volume icon, my network manager icon. It, it works like any other window manager except it's a little clunky because it's not really a window manager because at the end of the day, you're still basically just living full time in Emacs, but it does work. The next question is, hey DT, what do you do for a living other than YouTube and library? So uh, earlier this year, right around the COVID pandemic started, and then of course we had the lockdown here in the U.S. It was about fe February, I think. I told you guys that I was uh, quitting my job. I was actually going to lose my job anyway because of the pandemic, and then the company I worked for actually went out of business, so they went bankrupt. But I've been doing nothing but YouTube and library full time this whole year, and that's still like what I'm currently doing is I'm just making videos. That is my full time job at the moment, and it's been going well. I, I can't complain. I've been getting by with it, and I, I will admit, though, I do kind of miss working a regular job. I do kind of miss working in retail, which is what I had been working in for years before obviously the, the pandemic. And I do kind of miss that line of work. I'm not sure if I'm going to jump back into that line of work anytime soon, but you know, especially around the holiday season, you know, I kind of miss the action of Black Friday and then all the, the holiday season and, you know, all the inventory that comes in and the, you know, the big retailers. It's just a, a I enjoy that time of year. I know that's so weird because I know a lot of you guys have probably worked retail and hate it. I actually like it. I like dealing with people. So, but right now, all I'm doing is this here. And the final question is, hey, DT, can you make a video about why you prefer Caden Live over DaVinci Resolve? So Caden Live is a video editor. It's the one I use to make all my videos. It's free and open source software. DaVinci Resolve is a video editor. It is not free and open source software. I choose to run free and open source software where possible. That's why I use Caden Live. DaVinci Resolve is licensed under a proprietary license. So in my book, it's proprietary poo. I don't use proprietary poo. 
Now, I'm assuming that the person asking this question is a new subscriber to the channel. They haven't been watching my videos for very long. Those of you that have been around for a little while know that I try to use free and open source software only where possible. Unless there's no free alternative, then I'll use proprietary software. For example, some pieces of equipment that I have have to have proprietary drivers. My laptops have to have proprietary Wi-Fi drivers if I want Wi-Fi on those laptops. And of course, I want Wi-Fi on my laptop, so I install the proprietary Wi-Fi drivers because there's no free and open source alternative. It's the same thing with video drivers. If I owned an NVIDIA card, which I don't currently own any machines that have an NVIDIA card, but if I did have one, I would have to install the proprietary NVIDIA drivers to get the full power out of that card. There is an open source NVIDIA driver, but it's horrible. It's almost unusable. So in that case, I would install the proprietary NVIDIA driver. But for 99.9% .9 of the things I do on my computer, there are free and open source alternatives out there to the proprietary software. And those are the ones that I'm going to use. So Caden Live is actually a really fantastic video editor. I don't know if DaVinci Resolve or Lightworks or any of this other stuff is better. I've never tried them. I never will try them. I know DaVinci Resolve and Lightworks both have Linux clients, but I can't really tell you anything about them. Uh, maybe they're better as far as, you know, just on technical merits, but based on philosophy, <laughs> just based on the ethics of it. I choose to run Caden Live. Uh, people often ask me about some of the other video editors that are not available on Linux. They're only available on Windows or Mac. Things like Adobe Premiere, I believe it's called. I, I've never run any of those. I haven't had a machine that ran Windows that I owned personally in 12 years. I haven't ran Macs since like the 1990s. So I don't know anything about Windows or Mac only software. I've been strictly a Linux user for many, many years now. And like I said, I try to stick to free and open source software where possible. As sometimes people ask me, will I cover particular pieces of proprietary software? People have asked me, hey, will you take a look at the Microsoft Edge browser on Linux now that it's on Linux or the Vivaldi browser on Linux or in this case, DaVinci Resolve? No, no, I, I don't cover proprietary software, especially when there's such good free and open source software out there, free and open source alternatives that I would rather spend time covering those and letting people know about those fantastic free programs out there. And that's it for this edition of Hey DT. Now, before I go, I do need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of the show. I need to thank Devin, Fran, Gabe, Corbinian, Mitchell, Akami Arch, 5530, Chris, Chuck, David, Donnie, Dylan, Gregory, Lewis, Paul, Pick, B, Yum, Scott, and Willie. They are the producers of the show. They are my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. And the show is also brought to you by each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen. This long list of names here. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because this channel has no corporate sponsors it's sponsored by you guys the community please consider subscribing look for distrotube over on patreon all right guys peace